I'm really excited to have you here for, uh, for AstroFest uh, 22. This is our 40th AstroFest, and um, it's great to see a bunch of new faces here. Just um, We also want to welcome those people that are watching on the live stream. And uh, so actually, for those on the live stream, uh, we, we need to do a little pan here. So everybody, let's wave to everybody out on the internet. Hello, internet. Hello, internet, all right. Nice to have you here with us. Um, so, because there's so many new people here, um, actually, right, show of hands, who's here for the first time? All right, good number of people, good number of people. So, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna run through a, a little presentation about, about Copernic. So again, my name is Drew Desker, I'm the, the executive director. And Copernic Observatory is named after Nikolai Copernic, otherwise known as Nicholas Copernicus. Now, Normally, when I do this for, for the public, I ask, does anybody know what Copernicus is famous for? I don't think I need to ask this group here. Uh, but for those that may not quite remember, Copernicus developed what's called the heliocentric model of the solar system. Up until Copernicus' time, everybody thought that all the planets uh, in the sun all revolved around the Earth, but like sometimes those planets looked like they were moving backwards, which we call retrograde motion. So. Um, Copernicus did the math and said, no, it doesn't work that way. And uh, so uh, in 1973, Copernic would have been 500 years old. And a group of Polish immigrants, people of Polish heritage here in the area, wanted to commemorate Copernic's 500th birthday. And rather than put, you know, just buy a statue, plunk it in the park, and say, we're done, they said, no, let's do something. So they built the original observatory. Um, the cornerstone we have uh, right here at our this, actually, this, this uh, brick building is part of the original building, but that cornerstone uh, that was part of the original building uh, was sort of set by uh, these people here. And uh, so the man in the red jacket is Dr. Ed Kozlowski. Uh, at the opposite end is, Dr. Uh, is uh, Richard Miller. They were part of the, the Copernic Society. The contractor that built it, Ed Neslik, was also Polish heritage, but the gentleman in the um, black jacket, does anybody recognize that face? It's Commander Jim Lovell of Apollo 13. So this was two years after the Apollo 13 mission that safely returned as they had their disaster on the way, uh, uh, way to the moon. So again, in, in the early 70s, that's what this place looked like. Uh, we basically had one, uh, just, you know, one building and, and two domes. It was then donated to the Robeson Museum and Science Center down in downtown Binghamton. And uh, in the 1990s, they expanded it to what we look like today. There you go. So here's, uh, here's what we look like today. We see the, the expansion added about five, uh, five times the amount of floor space. We added uh, an additional dome, uh, solar panels. Uh, but in 2006, Robeson was uh, looking at their finances and said this, the Copernicus is a little too expensive for them to run, so they were going to shut it down. So the Copernicus Society said, look, if you don't want it anymore, we'll take it back. And so, in 2007, Copernic came back to the Copernic Society of Broome County, and that's who, who runs uh, Copernic. We are a 501c3 uh, informal STEM education facility. Uh, we are an observatory, clearly, but we do uh, much more than that. So we really try to be an, an innovative leader in interdisciplinary, lifelong learning in STEM. <coughs> and uh, the key here that I, I, that I like to really focus on is lifelong learning. Uh, and you'll see a little bit about what it is that we, uh, we do here. So we have a, our, our program is primarily aimed at, at school-aged children. Uh, we call it our Copernic Talent Search. And uh, so clearly not everything we do is astronomy-based. We offer a, a program called Girl Power Science. And this is we try to get more women into you know, thinking about uh, STEM careers. So we always, uh, we always have a female subject matter expert uh, either zoom in or conference in with us um, tell us about the work that they do. And this, in fact, with this particular uh, uh, girl power, we were uh, looking at sort of uh, global warming and, and carbon dioxide levels and, and the satellites that they use to, to check that out. So we had a, uh, uh, an astrophysicist from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center make a presentation to our girls. And then at the end of her presentation, our girls get to ask her questions. And one of, the, one of our students asked, how did you get interested in astrophysics? Now, again, these are third to eighth grade girls. 
And I loved her answer. She says, when, when I was in college, I was an English major, but my boyfriend was a physics major. We would go from observatory to observatory. I eventually dumped the boyfriend, but I kept the astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> she now has her PhD in astrophysics and works for NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center. So we're really all about planting seeds. Uh, you never know where a seed's gonna, uh, gonna get planted and, and how it might grow. Uh, we do programs for children as young as uh, three years old with our Copernic Kids uh, uh, program so you begin to uh, look at the world um, sort of through the eyes of a scientist at, 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 at an age-appropriate level. We do take our programs on the road. We do robotics. We have a portable planetarium that we can take, um, cool. which is uh, a lot of fun. And uh, we have, not only go into schools, but we've even gone to uh, uh, a local hotel that would run a a Christmas experience uh, weekend, and we'd bring our dome down, and we would uh, show the kids what does Santa see in the sky when he leaves the North Pole and comes down to, to here. So uh, we have an opportunity to, to teach while we're entertaining. We do a lot of uh, summer camps. We have a very extensive uh, summer camp program that runs from literally as soon as school ends to just before it starts up again. Uh, this student is safely looking at the sun through one of our scopes, and tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow we hope to uh, be able to you know, do this as well, uh, skies permitting. Uh, we even have uh, had uh, an opportunity to have our students uh, go to the edge of space with a, a high altitude weather balloon. So, um, uh, so what this weather balloon uh, camp is about, the, they will build a payload, put some cameras and some scientific uh, uh, instruments on it, then launch it from, from here, and then we have some uh, ham radio tracking uh, equipment on board to track it through its light. Uh, so right now, this camera is looking right up at the balloon. When it starts out, when it lifts up from, from, the, from here at Copernic, it's probably about five or six feet in diameter. This is literally just before it uh, is going to um, uh, deconstruct. And at this point, the balloon is about 28 feet in diameter. And that orange, uh, or that, that gold uh, disc in the middle is a, a radar, radar reflector uh, so that the planes and the FAA know where, where it is. So I'll show you a series of pictures that um, this camera has taken. So this is right before it bursts. Here you start to see the envelope of the uh, balloon uh, shred. And this is my favorite picture because it still has that sort of glow kind of look to it. You can see the sun. Um, but it uh, then again rapidly uh, deassembles. And uh, let's see here, I can give you a, a sense of what that is like. So this is a, a, a high definition video uh, camera uh, from this same flight. You can see the curvature of the Earth, you can see that thin blue line that, that is our atmosphere. Um, but moments from now it'll, uh, it'll change into a an e-ticket ride, as it were. Uh, you'll see a little black cable come up. That's actually the um, uh, antenna we use for tracking. Uh, for those that are into ham radio, we use an APRS tracking uh, uh, board that uh, gives us the longitude, latitude, and altitude uh, every minute. So we're, we're able to then uh, recover it. We'll, uh, we'll let you keep your dinner here. <laughs> uh, we also do... Uh, uh, We've now started moving to VR and AR, and this Jeremy uh, Cardi is our live stream astronomer, and he's behind here, uh, behind me here, um, runs a camp on, on virtual reality and uh, for, for middle, age, uh, middle, school, middle school and uh, high school students. Whenever uh, people come up here, we, we mention the, the local astronauts that grew up in this area. There are four astronauts that grew up here in the southern tier. Eileen Collins grew up in Elmira, about, 20, uh, about 60 miles west of here. Dan Birch grew up right here in Vessel, and I like Dan's story is Dan applied four times to become an astronaut. He was turned down three times, but the fourth time he finally made it, and he actually flew four times. Uh, Doug Wheelock uh, is from Windsor, and he's actually on a, a ham radio station, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, uh, so he's from, Win uh, you know, from Windsor, New York. He is still an active astronaut. And then Doug Hurley uh, grew up in Appalachian, which is about four miles from here. Doug Hurley was the pilot of the last space shuttle mission back in 2011, and he and Bob Behnken were the first 
uh, crew members of the SpaceX Crew Dragon. They oh, were the, wow. that, the, the first two, so he was commander of that, uh, of that mission in 2020. So, uh, talk about ham radio, and um, we've had opportunity for our students at, at our summer camps to actually talk to an astronaut on the International Space Station using the ham radio station we have here. And um, so they learned about what, what training astronauts go through, uh, what kind of work they do on the International Space Station. We talk about uh, radio communication and, and, um, and satellite orbits. And I always, I love doing this. I ask the kids, you know, how many of you have ever talked on a radio of any sort that you could think of? So let me ask you, how many, raise your hand if you ever talked on a radio. And a couple of people. All right now, how many have you talked on one of these things? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's inside? I mean, that's really sort of what Copernicus is about, is, is helping people understand how, how the world works. Uh, you know, that isn't a magic brick. It's, it's a radio, it's got software in it, it's got, you know. So, um, anyway, um, as we're preparing for these, these uh, ham radio contacts, again, um, we only have about 10 minutes where we can talk to the kid, uh, talk to the astronauts, so we, we have to run a rehearsal with them, so there's a bit of choreography to make sure that they're in front of the microphone just when it's their turn to speak. And, um, Two years ago, we had um, uh, 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 one of the questions that a student asked was, um, how, what happens when you sneeze during a spacewalk? <laughs> well, that's a good question when you think about it. And he said, well, actually, that's happened twice to me. He said, usually what happens is, you know, you're in, you're in your spacesuit, and you have a little bit of room in there, but usually when you feel the sneeze coming on, you just bend your head down and, and sneeze down into your chest. But one time the sneeze completely caught me by surprise. All the boogers went on my face shield. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, that has to be the first time boogers have been part of an answer of <laughs> one of these. Uh, 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 so anyway, um, we do overnights. We do scout badges. Uh, I know um, some of you are camping here tonight, so you'll, uh, you'll get to enjoy that. Uh, we do a rocket fest where families come and build those Estes rockets and, and, and launch them. And of course, we do AstroFest. Uh, but every Friday night between, between March and mid-December, we'll do a, a Friday night program of some aspect of science or technology. It isn't always about uh, astronomy. Uh, we've had somebody talk about the physics of music. Why does a, a trumpet, a violin, and an oboe all sound different playing the same note? Um, in a couple of weeks, we will have uh, a gentleman from the, um, uh, actually, about next week, actually, is a gentleman from the New Jersey Institute of Technology uh, who does research in Antarctica, and he will be uh, talking about what is it like to work in Antarctica. Uh, we've got somebody from the National Weather Service. Uh, for those of you that came, that live in this area, remember in 2020 that 40 inches of snow we got, that, you know, so he's gonna actually talk about that particular snowstorm and give us a, a sense of where uh, where we think the weather is going to head um, uh, for this uh, for, for this coming winter, uh, and then of course afterwards, if uh, if it's clear, we we invite people out to to look at the night sky. Um, whenever there's any kind of a um, uh, astronomical event, we also will uh, we'll highlight <coughs> that. Uh, I'm not I'm not the best high I think there was. Um, uh, one of the other satellites that the Discovery Channel actually came up here and was sort of uh, uh, sort of broadcasting from, from there. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about our, our version of broadcasting uh, in, in a few moments. Um, kind of media wise, this actually this picture I took with my cell phone <laughs> right out here. Uh, and uh, we were able to uh, have a, a live stream uh, event of that as well. Of course, we'll, uh, we'll do meteor showers, we'll do uh, lunar eclipses, um, and of course, we'll do solar eclipses. Uh, this is back in 2017, uh, where we had nearly 1,500 people uh, up here. It was, uh, it was a great day for that. Um, and for those of you, um, this is actually a picture of our heliostat in our physics classroom, which actually will be open tomorrow. Um, we have a telescope that goes right straight through the roof and um, we have some, uh, a couple of mirrors up there that we can control in such a way so that when the sun hits one mirror, it goes to the next one down at the telescope, and we can project the sun's image against one of the walls in physics. And from, uh, from this side right here to this side right here is nine feet across. So you can really uh, get a good look at the, 
good looking for some. And of course we do, you know, we'll do birthdays and uh, you know, private functions as well. Uh, the other thing we we do a lot of work a lot of work with school uh, school systems and uh, not only the, the students but also the teachers. The there's now rolling out this next gen science standard, which is uh, in New York State. It's called the New York State Science Learning Standard, but basically it's a new way of teaching science. Uh, back when most of us were in, uh, in science class, you would read about some phenomenon or characteristic and then you would go into the lab and you just sort of prove it. They sort of swip, swap that now. And that, which, when you think about it, that's the way life works. You know, you, you, you come across some phenomenon that you've never seen before and you try to figure out what's going on. But anyway, so we are retooling all of our, uh, all of our programs to match the next year's science standard, but also we're offering professional development primarily to uh, elementary school teachers because they are more generalists and not science not, not science specific so helping them learn how to read the standard and, and deliver that content. Uh, for some of you that uh, have been here before um, or maybe haven't been here in a while and you've noticed a little something different out there it's it's our Copernic Science Park. We partnered with the Junior League of Binghamton. It's a uh, service organization here in Binghamton of, of women and they basically helped us raise nearly seven hundred thousand dollars to uh, put this playground in, and also deal with some uh, uh, some issues. We actually had a, a natural spring that was sort of coming up in the middle of the playground, and you'd put these little cones around to tell the kids, you know, "Don't go in there; there's a swamp." And that's the first place they go. <laughs> anyway, um, all of our all of our uh, structures that are in the playground. Um, we really try to focus on or, or, or highlight what aspect of science or technology is part of even everyday activities. Um, here is a geodesic dome that um, we talk about how architects use that as a, as a, as a design feature. Uh, we had Binghamton University students build a bridge for us. In fact, they, they built it in advance of actually you know, us having um, this pond. Uh, we actually created the pond to deal with that, that natural spring runoff. So we actually, uh, not only you put a bridge to span an existing water feature, we built our water feature to, to accommodate our bridge. <laughs> and uh, we also have a, a little library. We always, we try to promote uh, uh, reading. Um, and uh, this is actually a picture that uh, Jeremy had taken of, uh, of the science park. And you can, of course, see the, uh, the Milky Way in the, uh, in the background. Actually, we gotta get your, your newer one up there, Jeremy. But for us, it's knowing that we've planted that seed. Um, and we, soon after the science park uh, was built, we got this, uh, uh, an email from a, uh, from a parent that said, thanks for inspiring my little one today. She said, when I get bigger, I want to fly real fast in a rocket ship to the stars. So you never know, again, how and when you're going to plant that seed. And, and, uh, and really, that's what we're here to do. Um, one of the things. Um, so I mentioned that we, we do our Friday night programs, um, and back in March of 2020, um, when COVID really started shutting everything down, we had to shut down. Uh, I said we said okay, fine. You know we had this list of, of, of speakers ready to go, but all right, so we'll wait a couple of weeks. We'll let this thing blow over, and then we'll start back up again. Well, obviously that didn't happen. So we wanted to stay connected to the public. So we started live streaming, and our first live, pardon me, our first live streams were a little rough, but um, uh, since then they have really, really taken off. Uh, uh, Jeremy did um, has done a number of observing live streams, uh, putting cameras on on, on various scopes. Um, we've done uh, media showers. We've done. Um, Back at the end of 2020, with the uh, Saturn-Jupiter uh, conjunction, uh, at one point we had over 4,000 people on our live stream for that. Uh, and now this past May, uh, who saw that lunar eclipse uh, in, in the middle of May last year? I mean, earlier this year, <coughs> right? So Jeremy was up here and he did that. Um, and at one point we had over 25,000 people on our watching our uh, our live stream. I, and then the chat was flying by like a CVS receipt. It was, yeah. it was, it was wild. 
and, and people that were, were commenting saying that we, we left the NASA's live stream because we like yours better. And I really, I'm going to have to oh. big hand a, a round of applause to Jeremy. <laughs> Who's really taken this on, and uh, it's super. Uh, it, it's funny because we, we we initially said, well, we, we got to do something. Now it's become part of what we do all the time now, and uh, it's it allowed us now to reach literally people around the world. When, when Kana Neowes was was up, uh, people were saying, you know, I'm in I'm in Oslo, Norway. Where am, you know where do I look? You know, I'm in I'm in um, you know uh, literally across the world. So I know, Jim, if you want to talk a little bit about. Um, Actually, I don't need that. I had to switch the mic to that camera anyway, so oh, okay, we're good. All right. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to speak a moment about our live streaming because I know a lot of people aren't from the area, and this is a way that you can continue to interact with Copernic at home. And uh, our YouTube channel is Copernic Observatory. You can go and subscribe there. Uh, and if actually if I refresh this page, you'll see we're streaming Astrofest Day One right now. Um, so they're seeing me on the the stream uh, and and watching the presentations along with you in person. Uh, so all of our upcoming live streams for the fall are posted on our channel. Um, goes all the way into November. Our last one scheduled as of right now is Black Holes on Black Friday. Um, that's an exciting one. Uh, as, as Drew mentioned, we covered the May lunar eclipse. Um, we saw all, all, it was very popular uh, next to NASA. It was the best stream on YouTube, so we were very proud of that. Um, on November uh, 8th, there will be a lunar eclipse starting around 3 a.m. We're going to cover it. Um, especially if we have clear skies, uh, but maybe you'll end up watching the time lapse that we post after the fact, uh, or the recording of the stream. That is an early bird or a night owl event for sure, whereas uh, the May eclipse was uh, much more time friendly. It was, a, it was in the evening, uh, 9 o'clock onwards, I believe. Uh, so yeah, if you have access to all of those, you can go back and watch our previous streams. We just ran one on the Jupiter Close Approach um, this week. And that saw a total 67,000 viewers. So yeah, we're really excited to be accessing not just our local community, but go, growing beyond and sharing astronomy with everyone and the, and the fun that comes with it. Uh, if you're interested, you'll see all these little logos in the lower left corner of our videos. Um, I'll bring up this on the big screen here. We have three different program types. Um, there's the FNL, which is our Friday night live stream. Uh, that's the hybrid event where you can come uh, for an in the in-person version of that program, just like you're here now. Um, and then we also stream that same presentation on YouTube. So that's FNL. There's also NSL, which is Night Sky Live. Those are our observing live streams, the lunar eclipses, Jupiter Close Approach. And then uh, sort of this new one we call KRXN. If you're a chemist, perhaps you know RXN is shorthand for reaction. Um, so those are our Copernic reactions. We held one of those this week as well for the DART, uh, NASA DART event. We got to react to uh, the live images that came down. It was basically a video of that spacecraft smashing into asteroid Dimorphos. It was really awesome. Uh, so three types of programming, all live streams, by the way. We do occasionally post uh, video content, just produce content as well. But our priority is interacting with our audience. So we, we chose the live stream format. Um, but yeah, other than, other than that, maybe we'll see you on YouTube sometime or in person again. Thank you. Yeah. One of the nice things about um, this whole live stream thing, uh, again, it, it kept us connected with, with, uh, with the public, but what was also nice was that when we finally opened it back up to the public, those people that lived close enough would actually come here. So we actually, what, what used to be just a, a you know, a, I don't know, uh, you know, Drew's kids, 93, you know, all of a sudden, there's Drew and his kids. So uh, uh, it was great to, great to do that. So um, again, for those of you that are sort of the, interacting with, with uh, us for the first time, um, uh, we, of course, love to see you here in person, but uh, uh, check out uh, our, uh, the, the list of programs we're going to offer uh, every Friday night. And 
you can plug in uh, you know, and chat with us live or you know, or, or uh, watch that video uh, at, at your convenience uh, later, later on. So um, we have a person that's supposed to be uh, starting our 7 o'clock. Uh, she is in the Zoom session. And she is in the Zoom session. All right, well, let me uh, go bring that Zoom session up and get rid of this. And we will do a... Uh, hello, Lori. Can you hear me? We can, we can, and uh, I'm assuming you have got a presentation. I do. Is it okay if I share a screen? I'm going to work on that. Okay. I'm actually, uh, while you're working on that, enjoying your YouTube feed. I didn't know you had. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're very happy, very pleased with it. Right now we've got nearly, well, we have over 11,000 subscribers on it. Amazing. And um, it's been a lot of fun uh, interacting with people. Okay, you should be... Uh, Co-hosting. Yes, let me move over to the correct screen here. All right. Well, uh, Laura, we're just going to just. Uh, oh, actually, here I'm, I'm going to sit. So I don't know. If, I'm. You, can you? Can you see me here? I'm going to hand here. Everybody, say hi to Lori. Hi. Hi, hi everybody. My first plan was to be there. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but I'm glad to see you all there. All right, well, Lori, um, we'll, we'll let you, we'll just, I'll stop my tap dancing and uh, hand it right over to you, thanks. Very good, thank you. Uh, while at the uh, Spring Cherry Spring Star Party, I was approached by one of uh, the members up there and asked me to come here today and talk about this new telescope that I got actually got it as a result of um, uh, saving up all my unused vacation time and splurging on this one big telescope. It's called the mm -hmm. Unistellar EV Scope 2. I use it for astronomy outreach and for the Astronomical League programs and for my own personal observations. So let me uh, get the nerdy stuff out of the way first. <clears throat> for those of you who are curious about what it looks like, it's uh, this little picture over here on the right. Um, it's only a four and a half inch mirror, which normally we wouldn't think of as a very big telescope, but it's a very powerful telescope. And I'll explain that in a minute. It's got a field of view of 1.33 arc seconds, which means that it can see a little bit larger than the area that you can see when you're looking up at a full moon. <coughs> Now it's an electronic scope, so it does have a megapixel resolution and it does have an eyepiece, but the eyepiece is very special. It's a Nikon OLED screen that you look through, but it does give you that intimate experience that you would get in looking in any other telescope. Now, first of all, let me say, I'm not a Unistellar employee. I'm not selling Unistellar. I'm just, as a user, very sold on it, especially since I'm very passionate about sharing outreach through my own uh, astronomy club. So let me tell you that there is some filtration on it. It's a proprietary mix that does cut through light pollution. It's sort of a light pollution kryptonite. And in fact, it's even been accused, as I'll show you in some pictures in a little bit, of being a, light, a cloud filter. Now, every... <clears throat> hard time seeing what I'm seeing, but there's a magic trick to mine. It's got a built-in camera that takes an image as a default every four seconds and stacks it and stacks it and stacks it. And what you end up seeing over time looking through the eyepiece actually is an image that is like developing, like in a dark room, which is kind of interesting because my first career was in dark rooms and photography. And so um, bringing an image up on paper is not un unknown to me. It's very much like watching that image come up in that tray of chemicals. It's got storage of 64 megabytes and everything gets stored to your, your phone anyway. So that's not an issue. And the images are saved as PNGs. So they're, they're pretty robust and you can use them in presentations like this. The battery life is about nine to 10 hours and that's never been an issue for me. 
I do have a, a portable battery that um, sometimes I I plug it into if it's been left on overnight and I didn't know better. Um, but I can even plug my cell phone into it to charge my cell phone while I'm managing the scope. So let's go on to some more interesting things like this is what it looks like. Here's uh, Bill Nye, the science guy at a recent uh, trade show, um, checking out this scope and he gave it a thumbs up in another shot. But it all comes in this backpack, which as a Girl Scout trainer who trains leaders to bring girls out into the outdoors and camp several nights under um, skies, I have to say that the backpack is thoughtfully designed. The only slightly weird thing in terms of backpacking is that the tripod is off to the side. So as you're going through doorways, you just got to remember you're a little off kilter. But even by putting my few extras into the bag with the scope, it's only about 22 pounds, which is pretty good. Now, the reason why it's so important to be portable is that um, when you're going somewhere remote and you want to set up you also need to be aware of your surroundings, of course, situational awareness. Which brings me to the night that I was doing some globular clusters. And I was in my neighborhood and there was this beautiful open field, soccer field. Nobody was playing at 1.30 in the morning. But I did see a medevac helicopter come swooping in pretty quick and do a loop. And in that few minutes or minute or two, I should say, before the uh, fire trucks arrived to clear the field because the helicopter had spotted me with my little red lights down at my scope. I would managed to get my scope to go to park, plop it into my backpack, put my notes into my carry bag. And as the fireman greeted me, I was ready to go off the field in a shorter distance to get out of the way and hung out long enough to check out the helicopter and, and the fire trucks. So I have to say it's pretty portable. Now it is a new technology and the company itself is also very new. So they've had some growing pains. Um, mm -hmm. Just an example, here's a letter that they sent me. They've been doing this about two years and they just sold their 10,000th scope worldwide this summer. They are responsive as a company, and I give them a lot of credit for that. So I use it a lot for outreach, and I know that there are other fellow club members in the area that are looking for bringing this to their club for outreach, too. There are a couple things that um, uh, I want to point out for those who are into um, outreach, and that is um, the I have added reflectors to my tripod legs because when you have the public coming up, you want to make sure that they can see where they're, they're going. And I guide them with my red light because a spill for an expensive scope like this can be pretty expensive between planets or nebula or whatever you, you pretty much want to see. It's got all the Messier objects in there. It's got the NGC objects in there. And they're building with each release of this application more objects in there. You can also manually put in your uh, right ascension and your declination if you want to go to something a little more obscure. So in outreach, I also advise people, now don't touch it, because first of all, it's expensive. It's a serious piece of scientific equipment. But when it gets touched, it shakes the screen and sometimes it can lose what it's looking at. It'll um, say, oh, it's dropped, it's, it's enhanced vision is what they call it, that stacking of images every four seconds. And the eye relief to the eyepiece is pretty cool too because you don't have to take off your glasses. Most people don't have to take them off to look at the, the eyepiece and that's kind of nice. When I go to magnify to go from 50X to 400X, that's a pretty big jump. And so I usually try to warn people who are at the eyepiece, okay, I'm going to magnify this for you now. Otherwise, there's this uh, sense of vertigo because you get the little tiny ring nebula and it blows up and you can kind of lose balance. You don't want that to happen at your scope either. You explain to people what it is that the scope is doing, the, the plate solving, the images every four seconds, because quite frankly, um, this is not like any other scope that they may have seen before. 
I have to tell all of the astrophotographers out there and all those who have a traditional scope, this is simply a different animal. It does not replace astrophotography and it does not replace traditional telescopes. It's just different. Those little tiny fuzzy blobs that you see in the big scopes when you're looking at something important in the sky are just as important. Those photons directly hitting your eyes. This is not meant to take away from that at all. But it's important to explain the differences to people so they don't have a different or in, inaccurate kind of a um, anticipation going to a different scope or an observatory in the future. Also, uh, let's see, <clears throat> I have a little sign up for all of the outreach for folks to tell them to go to either their Google Play Store or wherever they get their iPhone apps, download the Unistellar app. There's only one that's named that. Set their Wi-Fi to the specific scope I'm at. There's actually a, another person in my club who has a scope and you differentiate them by the serial numbers. So you can actually go back and forth between scopes. And as I said, you've got, you can save the images on your phone. We usually also have an eight or nine inch tablet out there on a table so that people who are waiting to come up and see an object in line or they don't have their phone with them, they can see a larger image while they're waiting. What's really cool is that looking in the eyepiece or on the cell phone or on the Android tablet, each is a little different experience, as you can imagine, because they are different media interfaces. So they're all worth a, a look to see um, what they look like as they're presented in that particular mode. Um, a couple notes from usage. On a good day, I can usually walk to a site and be setting up and running in five minutes. On a bad day, maybe 15 minutes. And that could be either uh, when the scopes are trying to talk to other scopes or um, if there's clouds passing by and it's having a hard time plate solving. 15 minute setup is unheard of. Um, usually you've got the whole polar alignment thing going and whatnot. Now that um, I say, I also I have to say, I know that in the, the notes for AstroQuest, they had talked about um, um, very, uh, very much automation and not needing to know a lot. There is never any substitution for getting to know your sky. If you know where your major stars are, you can know where to point the scope to help it plate solve faster. If you're looking for specific objects, <clears throat> excuse me, it really helps to know what constellations they're in. It also helps to know where your constellations are so that you're not spending all of your time moving across the sky back and forth or not knowing what is actually up at that time. The app does help you by telling you how long something's gonna be up in the sky and also when something is gonna be rising. So they go hand in hand and it's a great way to build your knowledge and experience with um, the sky and astronomy. So I noticed too, that unlike um, other types of outreach, that when people come to the eyepiece for this particular scope, they're spending more time watching it because it's developing before their eyes instead of going, oh yeah, I see it. And then walking away without really absorbing the, Im in the, um, the image. And what I mean by that is that um, there's so much to be seen in any image that, or, or uh, object that you want to view, that if you take a few extra moments and really look at, let's say, uh, tomorrow's International Observe the Moon Night, um, see what's in those mare or in those craters and really take in that detail and appreciate what you're seeing. Um, so it's, it's really a thrill for me to see people spend more time at that eyepiece and really enjoy the observing. So um, I also run into times in which I'm having to convince people that they're really looking at a live image and it's not just something planted in there. Um, and then uh, the final really cool thing to add is that uh, some of our most seasoned astronomers in our club, even they come up to the scope and have a tremendous wow um, from the observation. So the first time I took it out, 
I was doing an event for 25 boys and girls and Boy Scouts, and we had the, the tablet out. And I um, set it up and figured, okay, here goes. Um, what they wanted was the green laser tour of the night sky, which I proceeded to do. And as I'm looking down at my phone and the tablet while I'm doing this talking, which usually you can only do one or the other, I'm watching the Crab Nebula develop before my eyes and the Pinwheel Galaxy. To be able to do outreach and do a night sky tour at the same time as managing a telescope <sighs> is mind blowing to me. I, I had thought I could do multitasking, but this was really to a next level. So I usually um, have, the, uh, as I mentioned, a sign at the, the telescope to help them figure out how to uh, set it up. But most people really want um, this uh, spelled out for them verbally. And usually they even start helping each other as one gets it. Oh, I got it. So that's pretty helpful in terms of the crowd enthusiasm. So let's get into a little bit about what this thing can do. What you see here is uh, an image that one of our astrophotographers took on the night just outside of Baltimore, actually, I guess about a month or so ago. It was cloudy. We literally could only see about six stars. And you can see in the background here, this is the Light Dome of Baltimore. We were in Owings Mills at Soldier's Delight Nature Center. And that's where we do a, a monthly um, outreach activity. With this kind of a sky, everybody else who brought telescopes was having a rough time. One of the stars that could be seen was Jupiter, which as we know isn't a, a star, it's just very bright. Using different exposures, I was able to pick up Jupiter, and I was able to then back off or, or let the, the exposure or like it would have been automatically and get some moons in. So we had some wow factor. This is my example of, oh, my gosh, this thing's got a, a cloud filter. Also that night, um, we were able to show, but whoops, um, the uh, uh, Hercules uh, cluster, which is M13, the Pinwheel Galaxy, the Ring Nebula, and Neptune. Um, these things were really not visible with the refractor and the other reflector that was here. Now, these look pretty good if um, you're not used to seeing images from the uh, this scope. But I want you to pay attention here to what the Pinwheel Galaxy looks like here. It looks real fuzzy and kind of washed out. And also this kind of jaggy image of Ring Nebula. I'm going to flip over to a second uh, in a second here and show you what they look like on a better night. So here's your ring nebula on a much better night and your pinwheel galaxy on a much better night. And let me flip back. Cloudy night, can't see stars. This is what we got outside of Baltimore. And then better night, ring nebula, <clears throat> pinwheel. So I don't know what their secret sauce is of filters, but I'm grateful for it. So now what I have for you is sort of my greatest hits from my six months with my Unistellar. And in that time, I've uh, completed the Astronomical League's Galaxy and Globular Cluster Challenges, the Globular Cluster Program Certificate and PIN, a couple of their NASA challenges. Um, I've captured most of the Messier objects and I have led numerous outreach events, and even under conditions like you saw, which were not favorable. Key here is the best telescope is the <clears> one you use. Well, for me right now, after years and years of star hopping, and I only got my first go-to uh, telescope, in other words, one that you could plug in something and it would go where you said, um, just about two and a half, three years ago. So this is a quantum leap for me. So in my um, greatest hits here, we have M81 and M82, which if you were looking up at the sky charts, you would see that uh, in terms of where Polaris is, these are little tiny objects not too far away from that. Uh, and both are really pretty galaxies. 
And what I've done here is I've left into the image this little overlay, they call it, this caption, if you will, so that you can have an idea of what size image you're getting, which is that 50x magnification, and then also how much of an exposure in time it took to get it. These don't compare to my friend's astro uh, photography images, but they're pretty outstanding when you consider the fuzzy blobs we see when we're looking just through a scope alone. <clears throat> so here we have the Whirlpool Galaxy. And again, like the pinwheel I showed you a little while ago, a lot of uh, detail here, including these uh, little stars poking through. This was a five minute exposure. And when I went fishing for my globular cluster program, um, I had to dig pretty deep and find some good clear skies. Here, two minutes, uh, short exposures for globular clusters work best for this. But this uh, little cluster in here is a magnitude 8.9. Now remember, really dark skies, your eyes, five or six, if you're really lucky. So this is 8.9, but this cluster here, is a magnitude 12. And as you can see, they're very, very faint and it's a very, very tiny object. Now you'll notice too that the caption in here flipped over from saying something like ring nebula or um, uh, NGC numbers. That's because these weren't in the library that it had. And I just simply plugged in my uh, right ascension and declination, like I mentioned in the beginning in order to give me the coordinates for where I wanted to go. It also saves the date and the uh, Latin log, the basic Latin log of where I was when I um, took the, the images. So um, it's always kind of nice to look at an object over a course of time and be able to compare what it did. So we've had comet, uh, C2017 K2 pan stars, which just basically is named for the observatory that finds it, over the course of um, many nights from June to August. The neat thing about comparing is that you can see the changes in the tail. Now, of course, there are different uh, atmospheric conditions for each of those nights, and that required different uh, exposure times. But the neat thing was watching it go from a longer tail to this more spread out, stubbier tail over time, being able to capture those images over multiple nights. And then as a lark, uh, visiting a, a fellow um, uh, astronomy clubs, uh, grilling and gazing event is what they call it. And uh, one of the more seasoned fellows said, hey, um, let's, uh, let's see the Eastern um, Veil Nebula. Okay, pointed it off that way, played with the exposure a little bit. And this is something that's near Cygnus. Uh, it's, um, um, that's the, the, the great swan that's basically flying across the Milky Way right overhead this time of year. And without using any extra filtration, I'm still playing with that and some of the adapters, I was able to get some detail and some color out of this. Now with uh, traditional astrophotography, you're gonna have the right filters, you're gonna have uh, more stacked images and it's gonna subtract out a lot of this extra light and this bloating. But for my purposes, I'm thrilled I even got to see it. I'll take that. We also had this year a supernova that appeared in M60. And you can see this little tiny dot that appears between these two galaxies here. And I have it on two different dates. So the first date actually is June 17th. And then the second date was June 29th. Um, mm -hmm. A bit different exposures here. Uh, but it's kind of neat watching the amount that the uh, the supernova, its light appeared and, and disappeared some. My favorite, though, have got to be the nebulas. I guess I'm a sucker for the colors, maybe from being spoiled with the Hubble images. So I've got the 
Cocoon Nebula here. I uh, love the, the reds and blues and greens. And the Lagoon Nebula here, which is M8. And here I've got M17, the Omega Nebula. Now, not too long ago, September 20th, looking at my caption, I learned of this new nebula because um, um, the app will tell you what's close to where you are if you put in the filter for it. I found this uh, Heart Planetary Nebula. The first thing that we saw as we had the image coming up, and this is a three minute exposure, was this cluster of stars that appeared in a heart shape. And I thought, okay, that's kind of neat. Looking deeper though, I could see this nebula in a heart shape right beneath it. Thus, I assume that's where it gets the name, the heart nebula. Sort of a double-double there. And M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, which I understand has some variable stars in here. So I've been trying to capture an image every so often. And I want to compare those over different months and see where the variable stars are. I want to explore those a bit more too with this, which this makes it a whole lot easier to do. And here's the Trifid Nebula, which as a Girl Scout reminds me a lot of the uh, the thanks badge, which um, is uh, something that they give as the highest honor, which I recently received this year. And it looked a lot like that. And I like the pretty colors, of course. Lori, now, it looks like looks to me like uh, based on your long, longitude and latitude, you must have been on a trip for this for this image. Um, the uh, going to thirty five one oh seven. I Got went it. to um, Alcon which was held in Albuquerque, New Mexico this year. And we had one, I learned the term sucker hole, uh, mm -hmm. which is a hole in the clouds, just enough to get you to set everything up that doesn't last long. But the first night we went to their club's observatory um, and um, outdoor pads, it was dark enough and nice enough, um, really dark skies. I set up yeah. and I got some images. Yeah, we're working on finding some sucker holes for tonight as well. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. I was worried about y'all actually, given the forecast that we have here in Maryland. Yep. But that's a good catch. The The fact that suddenly uh, my um, Latin long shifted quite a bit and went 107 to the west instead of 77 for most of these. So here's a, a not, not exactly full moon. Um, but here's an example of what I had mentioned earlier in the beginning about how your field of view is just a little bit larger than what a full moon would be. The scope is not really designed to do planetary, I mean, the solar system objects. I find that in order to do the moon or the sun or planets that I really have to do it in something called live view, which means just as the scope is seeing it and without the stacking going on in what they call enhanced view. And that's what this is, which is why it shows uh, 0.12 milliseconds as the exposure for the moon. And let's see. And I got some uh, nice little galaxies here. And here's a, a triplet that was such a delight to get all into to one eyepiece. Uh, this one is a seven minute exposure in order to get enough light to come through to show those, whereas the cigar galaxy is only two minutes because it's a much brighter object. Yes, I did fit um, a proper solar filter onto it and try some solar observations. There are a couple little sunspots in there and this plane was just then deciding to fly into the sun. And actually, that's not true. It was flying by, and I happened to click the, the, the camera button quick enough. And this is a cloud blocking part of the sun. Do we need to try to get an ISS transit? Yeah, I suppose, because my astrophotographer friends have gotten that. But this is the point where I, I stop and I ask if there are questions and uh, get your feedback on uh, what you're interested in hearing about. All right, um, let's see here. We're at, uh, because we got sort of a large room here, we're gonna, I may need to repeat the uh, uh, 
the question. Do we have any, any questions here um, in the room? Or do we have any questions from the chat? I was I, I was going to ask you about the uh, the solar filter whether or not you could in fact uh, and obviously you answered that uh, so that just um, uh, sort of a classic solar filter that fits on the uh, right in front. I bought the um, what is it Thousand Oaks gel filter and okay. what I usually like to do is uh, build around it a cardboard frame with um, some legs that I then just simply rubber band around it rather than pay for the the heavy metal frame for it right. and then i keep it uh, carefully um, protected in an envelope all right uh, uh, question go ahead oh the first question obviously would be how much it costs and first question is how much does it cost well like i said i saved up all my pennies and uh, my hours this particular telescope with the backpack was 5200 i mm -hmm. did see on the website that the equinox version which does not have the eyepiece is on sale right now for two thousand. Right, and and a follow up question or? Oh, really? It's the eyepiece that is interesting. And couldn't you just combine that with any camera on any telescope? Did you hear that? I'm not sure how you could combine that with any telescope. Um, I suppose. The equivalent would be if you were going to put the cell phone mount on the eyepiece, but why do that when it's got the built-in <laughs> Wi-Fi? Okay. Uh, any other questions here uh, in the room? Uh, any, uh, okay. yeah. uh, so someone in the chat was wondering uh, if you could show us the app at all. If I could show the what? Show, show the app at all. Oh. Um, yeah, I could. By virtue of the magic of Zoom, I can hold up my phone. Okay. Yeah, why don't, if you uh, stop sharing, then we'll have a, a little better view of it, I think. I will stop sharing. That's a good point. So, this is uh, what the app looks like. Yep. And, and yeah. it has um, a section called Gallery where it saves all of the images that you wanted to save. Right now, mine's got uh, oh, it's something close to 2,000 images in there. But I can go to any particular date that I've shot something, and I can pull it up. There's Pluto. I bet you can see that real good. Yeah. Actually, that one's not Pluto. That one is uh, Saturn. Sometimes if you go too quick with the app, um, it'll put the wrong uh, caption on there, so you gotta know what it is that you're you're trying to to do with it, and know what your your sky chart looks like. But it also, when you um, click on something, let's let's just do uh, M10, a globular cluster. Your cheat sheet for observations comes up, so you can stand there during. Um, outreach and you can say it's got a diameter of 80 light years and it contains 200,000 stars at a distance of 14,000 light years and it shows you where it is in the constellation what magnitude a lot of them have descriptions many of them don't but there's like a whole encyclopedia now all of your viewers that have also um downloaded the app and are watching on their devices can also touch or click on the object and get that same encyclopedia of information come up for them. You can also filter by a number of things. Um, you have a, a whole bunch of things that you can choose, like you can decide that you want to only see what objects are available as planets or asteroids. There's a whole uh, um, citizen science thing that you can get involved in as they're trying to find near earth asteroids. Um, so you can choose any of these and filter for it. And then you can also sort by um, order of appearance, by recommended, alphabetical, and proximity to what you're observing. I like this one the best, I'm trying to do this in reverse here, because I don't wanna spend my night slewing all over the sky. 
in the prior version of this app, it didn't let you go into the app to look at stuff unless you were hooked up to the telescope. And I don't have the telescope hooked up right now. We've got uh, rain from Ian coming in. Yeah. So my question is, um, do you do the software? Uh, do you have to connect the scope directly to a computer for downloading for things like um, you know, comets? Uh, also, do, do they have any satellites you know, uh, that you can download as well? So um, you only need connectivity to the world by cell towers if there is an app that needs to get loaded to upgrade. Um, otherwise, it's totally meant for off-grid. You don't have to be connected to external. In fact, you can't be connected to two Wi-Fis at once. Mm. Um, I want to just uh, mention one thing because I can see in your background there you've got pillars of creation. Yeah. I got approached at uh, the Cherry Springs Star Party by um, a couple of fellows who were getting ready to set up at about 12 or 1 in the morning. And they said, because um, I had done a, a brief presentation mm -hmm. there and said, I'm taking requests. You know, what have I got to lose? Let's see what it'll do. And they asked for pillars of creation. I'm thinking, yeah, that's going to happen, right? <laughs> well, we plugged it in. And it wasn't a great night at Cherry Springs, but it wasn't bad either. Darned if we didn't get it. Wow. It wasn't Hubble quality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I just wanted to, to mention that. But yes, this is meant for off grid. Um, it's uh, so basically you download, every, download everything to your phone, then your phone tells the, uh, the scope, go here. Yes, this is the controller. Right. And in fact, when you go into the um, my EV scope, mm -hmm. it'll tell you if you have, uh, if you are connected, which is kind of important because sometimes it'll drop connection. And also if you are an observer or a controller, because sometimes it'll pop out of that, which is another bug that they're working on. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you um, what your status is on your battery and how much uh, storage you've filled up. It'll also give you this place to, to park it. And park it is make, basically um, having it go up to the vertical position for putting back um, in your, your um, backpack. So uh, I don't know, what, uh, I'm assuming you've got an external battery to, that you use and how, how long can you run on that battery? So there is a battery built in. It um, is eight to 10 hours. The only time that I have actually run out is when I must have left it on by accident. And my backup was uh, my um, Jackery battery. So I just simply plugged it into the Jackery and my cell phone was running low too. plugged that into the Jackery and I was fine. So I have never run out in a, a session, even when I've had my cell phone plugged into it to um, charge it at the same time. There is uh, this sensor cal calibration that um, needs to get done periodically. Much um, like when you're doing uh, astrophotography, you need to take dark frames to help it subtract out noise. With the, the lens cap on, it'll do like the equivalent of dark frames and it will use that when it's doing its, uh, its um, uh, every four second, uh, exposures to help uh, get rid of the noise in the background. So there is that uh, calibration that they say you should do periodically. Very cool. Um, any other questions here or in the chat? I've got one more. Oh yeah, sure, another one. Um, you obviously took it to Albuquerque. Any special packing required? Okay, so um, I uh, have been retired for 11 months, so I'm still a little nuts. We drove from Maryland. Um, and um, I kept it in the backpack and I did strap it into its uh, backseat safety belt, which is what the library uh, telescope folks tell you to do with uh, library telescopes. And I figured, okay, that should be good enough. And it was fine. I didn't need to recolumate when I was there to get those images. Um, there are some discussions on social media for what to do for plane flights. 
And there is a Pelican case, both with and without foam, depending upon if you're going to use the backpack that um, is available on Amazon uh, that's getting recommended by folks to use. I haven't gotten one yet, but I think it's on my list. I was going to, you, you answered one of my questions. It was, uh, does the scope require collimation? And uh, obviously it, it's capable of being collimated. Yes, and it's uh, pretty critical. Um, as it would be for any decent scope. It's all electronic. Um, you do have to adjust some exposure in here. You do get a crosshair uh -huh. um, and you are moving it around um, with the, the there's two uh, set screws. Um, the uh, Bob's knobs, people tell me though, that it's so proprietary that there isn't a knob that they can make for that. So you have to use some of the hardwares that are, are provided in there. Because I did ask them. All right. Very cool. Um, unless there's any other questions, um, this is cool. And now, now I know the Copernic Astro Society is going to say, <laughs> Drew. Time for a fundraiser. A, when can we get one? <laughs> All right. So how many people do we have here? Uh, for charge? <laughs> so let me see here. I just give you a sense again of, of who else here. So. Um, well, this is this has been great. It's funny because Art had told me about about the scope in, in your presentation, and um, I said, "All right, well, let's, let's let's see what it is. Just a, is this just another scope?" And clearly, it's not. Uh, and so, uh, so thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience with this. Uh, I think what's nice um, is the fact that you know you don't work, you know, for, for Unicellar. That you are just, you're in a, you're a user, and clearly. Uh, a four and a half or, or five star uh, reviewer uh, of it. So um, uh, anyway, so thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you for having me. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. All right, good. So for those that are going to be here again tomorrow, we've got a, a sort of an astronomy club round table and, and Lori will uh, be part of that as well. Uh, so, um, We've got about uh, 12 minutes or so before we start our next presentation, which is Dr. Kelly Leppo from the Space Telescope Science Institute, who is going to be talking about our new favorite telescope, the James, uh, new favorite space telescope, the uh, James Webb. So um, take uh, take 10 minutes to uh, for a bio break and uh, come on back and we'll, uh, and Lori, if you want to watch that, go to our YouTube channel. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I've got the YouTube on the other channel. I'm on the other right. screen here and I'll, I'll enjoy it there. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Take care.
our next presentation. Um, one of the most, probably the most exciting telescope ever built uh, is the James Webb Telescope. And um, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, I, on occasion I have an opportunity to go down to uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center and I was able to actually watch it being built uh, or these parts of it being built. Uh, and uh, it is huge. <laughs> it's quite frankly bigger than this room, uh, the sun shield. And um, uh, we were so excited to watch it launch on, uh, on Christmas morning. And then of course watched um, as, uh, as it progressed out to uh, L2. And then um, we were fortunate enough to do a uh, sort of a, a, a KRN, a, a RXN a, a reaction a live stream. We live streamed the um, the first images uh, from, uh, from from there on our YouTube channel. But um, we are extraordinarily lucky and fortunate to have uh, Dr. Kelly Lebo, uh, who works at the Space uh, Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, and. Um, I think she's got some some neat photos to show us. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm going to stop rambling here. And uh, Kelly, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for okay. joining us for AstroFest 20, uh, 2022. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I hope the, uh, the hurricane is not uh, dampening your observing tonight too much. But if anything, I will at least show you some pretty pictures uh, tonight. <laughs> Uh, and also, if you're interested in going into more details, if you want to do a, a deep dive into web science, we're going to do another talk tomorrow night, FAQs about JWST, um, which is going to be my sneaky way to talk about Spectre a lot, I think. But stay tuned tomorrow. But for right now, we're going to um, explore together Webb's first look at the universe. Again, my name is... Dr. Kelly Lipo, I'm an education and outreach scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, so from this rather humble looking office building on the campus of Johns Hopkins University, um, we have the um, science operations of the Hubble Space Telescope. So we decide like who gets Hubble time and also uh, do a little bit of making, keeping the telescope running. It's going on 30 plus years now. Uh, and we're also the home of the science operations of the James Webb Space Telescope, the mission operations of the James Webb Space Telescope, and also the home of the MAST archive, which holds all of the data that's coming back from Hubble and Webb and a whole bunch of other telescopes. Uh, so a couple floors above my office is the, uh, the MOC, the Mission Operations Center. Uh, where we send commands to Webb uh, from Baltimore, which is really exciting. It's a really exciting place to work, and I'm excited to be here and to share with you a little bit about Webb's uh, science and what it's seen so far and what you have to look forward to over the next year or so. Uh, so what we are going to talk about tonight, well, we will start off with how Webb came to be then we'll talk about why we want to study infrared light. And then we'll talk about uh, web science, the science that it's already done, and the science that's upcoming. Uh, so let's start in the 1990s. So I am an elder millennial. The 1990s were very formative for me, and the 90s were also very formative for space telescopes. Uh, so NASA launched a series of great observatories uh, including the Hubble Space Telescope, which launched in 1990 and is still up there today. It, obso it observes uh, UV light, a little bit of a, U a little bit of UV light, visible light, and a little bit of infrared light. We have the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which was launched in 1999 and also is still functional today. It observes X-ray light. And also the Spitzer Space Telescope, which uh, its mission went from 2003 to 2020, and it observed infrared light. And so if we take uh, the images produced by those telescopes, we get different looks into the universe. So every wavelength range that you observe the universe with, you learn something different. So for example, we have four pictures here. 
On the upper left-hand corner, we have a picture of the Crab Nebula. That is a pulsar. It is the corpse of a massive star, which is more massive than the sun, but the size of a city like Baltimore. And we're seeing here uh, electrons spiraling around the massive uh, magnetic fields around this star and producing X-ray light. And then if we're moving over one, we have the star Zeta Ophiuchi, as seen by the Spitzer Space Telescope. Normally, this is shrouded in dust, but looking at it with Spitzer's infrared eyes, we see a star blowing these massive winds, plowing into the gas and dust around it, and causing something called a, a bow shock, it's like a boat traveling through the water. We are shocking the gas around the star. And then on the bottom left-hand corner, we have the Ring Nebula, as seen by Hubble in visible light. Here we're seeing the outer layers of a dying star like our sun just gently wafting off. And just a note that planetary nebulas, of course, have nothing to do with planets. The bad name, uh, this is an, yet another reason why astronomers should not be allowed to name anything. Uh, but it, they sort of look like a planet if you have a small telescope. But yeah, they are- to me how that looks like a crab. I, you know. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's actually, yeah, historically it did, now it doesn't, the name stuck. Again, <laughs> bad at naming everything. Um, and then we have the antenna galaxies, which are two galaxies which are merging together. This has triggered a lot of star formation, and we're seeing it through all three of those telescopes. We're seeing uh, the gas and dust and forming stars. We're seeing normal stars inside of these galaxies. And with X-rays, we're seeing massive stars at the very end of their lifetimes, X-ray binaries, these neutron stars and black holes with uh, gas disks that are emitting the most energetic light. So all of those pictures are really cool, but there's one picture which really motivated Webb, and it's this, or more precisely, something like this. So this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a successor to the original Hubble Deep Field, which was uh, taken in uh, 1995. They spent 10 hours observing an otherwise dark patch of sky, and this came out. So looking at this image, almost everything in here is a galaxy. So there are a couple stars in here. You can see uh, a few of them. There's one sort of on the upper left, one at the bottom right, they're spiky. So bright stars look spiky in Hubble's view. And there are a couple fainter stars in there as well, but there are 10,000 galaxies in this view from Hubble. And we've added to this over time. And so this is about um, 25 hours, I think, of time in total. Um, but I might be wrong about that. I don't have my numbers in front of me. But anyways, if we uh, spread these out over time, um, so we have the entire 3D universe compressed into a two-dimensional image, right? But telescopes are time machines. So every time we look out into space, we're looking back in time. And so now we can start with a little bit more information, arranging these galaxies by distance and arranging them by time. So we can look backwards into the history of galaxies. So we have uh, nearby galaxies, which look like spirals and ellipticals that you might be used to seeing. But as you go back in time, things start getting blobbier and smaller and redder. So why is that? Well, the redder part is kind of easy to explain. It's because the universe itself is expanding, right? So the light from ancient galaxies has taken a long time to travel to us. And as it travels through space, space expands and that stretches the light to even redder wavelengths, longer wavelengths, which means that light that was initially emitted sort of at UV or optical wavelengths uh, has gotten stretched out into uh, infrared wavelengths. So that means that there's a point at which that Hubble picture of the ancient universe cuts out because light will have stretched so far from those ancient galaxies 
it's no longer in the type of light that Hubble can see. So here's a diagram showing the wavelength ranges of some of our favorite telescopes. So we have Hubble on the left here, and this goes from uh, a little bit of UV light, as I said, through the visible light that our eyes can see into a wee little bit of the infrared. Um, and so that means that if your light is redder than what Hubble can see, you just can't detect that galaxy. Spitzer, on the other hand, is an infrared telescope, but the problem is it has a very small mirror, so you can't detect very faint, small, ancient galaxies. And so this is why we designed Webb. Webb is in this sweet spot seeing from the near infrared or really the sort of orange red end of visible light through near infrared light into mid infrared light. Uh, development on the next generation space telescope actually began before Hubble even launched. So there was this very famous conference at um, the Space Telescope Science Institute where I work to come up with ideas for the next great space telescope. Um, but it was really these discoveries in the 1990s that really put uh, Webb forward. And we started coming up with these concept images for Webb. So here is one here. It was called the Next Generation Space Telescope at the, at the time. Construction began in uh, 2002, and that is also when the telescope was renamed to the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so here is the final design. You can see some very iconic features of Webb. We have this giant mirror. We have a tennis court sized sun shield, and we have a uh, mirror which is not enclosed in a tube like Hubble is. It is out into open space and it is shielded from the stray light and the heat from the sun, the earth, and the moon by this giant sun shield. Uh, so here is Webb with human for scale. It is like really super big. Uh, it has a 6.6 .6 meter mirror made out of 18 hexagonal gold coated segments. And you can also see the tennis court size sun shield with human for scale. Uh, so uh, construction finally finished in uh, 2021, testing and construction. The telescope was finally ready to go and it launched, uh, as I think some of you saw on uh, December 25th, 2021 in the pre-dawn hours uh, from the uh, European spaceport near Karoo, French Guiana. So I don't know what you were doing. I was, uh, you know, there with my very fancy pajamas watching <laughs> the NASA live stream along with my family. Uh, so this is launching NASA's next flagship observatory. Uh, and its goal is to see the infrared sky with much greater uh, clarity into greater depth than ever before. Okay, next slide. There we go. <laughs> uh, so this is our last view of Webb. So everyone say goodbye, Webb. Good luck. Uh, I hope you have lots of fun observing. Uh, so we can see a couple things from this image. From send back pictures, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, send back some good pictures from your vacation. Uh, yeah, so we <laughs> are uh, seeing the underside of Webb from a camera mounted on the rocket fairing. Ariane Spas did this special for this launch. Um, we can see that the telescope is, is folded up into a compact shape, and it's also very shiny. So we're seeing the underside of the telescope. Uh, Webb was this, in, or is, this incredible folding telescope. So it is bigger than our biggest rocket, um, and it was designed to fit just barely inside of the Ariane 5 rocket in its folded up shape. And then over the course of 30 days, it slowly unfolded itself as it traveled from Earth to its parking spot at L2, about a million miles away from the sun. And so these steps included uh, deploying and tensioning the sun shield, unfolding the secondary mirror supports, which is the little mirror in front of the big mirror, and also uh, unfolding the wings of its primary mirror. Uh, so after Webb went to L2, 
it started cooling down and it was able to cool down because of this five layer sun shield. Uh, and these are very, very thin layers of aluminum coated Kapton. They are about um, somewhere between a thousandth of an inch and two thousandths of an inch thick. Uh, and they allow us to have a really huge temperature difference between the hot side and the cold side. So the hot side where the um, communications equipment is and the solar panels are, the side that faces the sun is something like 260 degrees Fahrenheit or 125 degrees Celsius. On the cold side, it is minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 235 degrees Celsius. So huge temperature difference, and that's done just by blocking and reflecting away any light that gets near web. Uh, another important feature of web is this giant mirror. Uh, so web has a 6.6 .6 meter diameter mirror that's uh, 21.7 feet. And it's big for several reasons. Uh, it needs to be big because we want Hubble-like resolution in the infrared. And it turns out that the redder the wavelength you want to observe, the bigger the mirror you need to get the same resolution. Also, the bigger the mirror you have, the bigger the light bucket you have, and the fainter the objects you can observe. Uh, Webb has four instruments on its back. They live behind the mirror. Uh, there are three uh, near-infrared instruments, near-spec, nearest, and near-cam. And uh, nearest is combined with a fine guidance sensor, which helps point the telescope. And then there's also one mid-infrared instrument, MIRI. And as I said, Webb is orbiting at this point called L2, the second Lagrange point. It's about a million miles away from the Earth. Um, and it's there for two reasons. Um, number one, it is uh, away from the heat of the sun, the earth, and the moon. And it's also very thermally stable, which is important um, for reasons that we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope orbits around the earth and that temp it experiences pretty big temperature fluctuations and that won't do if you want to observe the infrared very well. And uh, how do we talk to Webb? Well, we talk to Webb via the Deep Space Network. Uh, there are three different uh, stations, one in California, um, one in um, Spain, and one in Australia. And we send commands from Baltimore to the Deep Space Network, and that gets sent up to Webb, um, and then Webb sends stuff down. Uh, we can send uh, about 57.2 gigabytes of data every day down from web in two downlink opportunities per day. And you get a maximum data rate of 28 megabits per second. So that's how fast space Wi-Fi is. And it takes about five seconds from for data uh, to travel at the speed of light from web to Earth. Okay, so web was at L2. It cooled down, and then we had to align the mirrors. So there's 18 mirror segments. At first, they were all operating as independent telescopes. And then through this process, which took uh, months, we very painstakingly aligned all of the mirrors to a single point. And then we released this image. This is web in focus at a single point. And that's one bright star dominating the image, this engineering test image, our, our first uh, in-focus picture that Webb sent back. And the star is cool, but what really got astronomers excited was the background. So almost every single point of light in the background is a galaxy. <laughs> so we have taken an accidental deep field here. Um, and if you look in the background, you can see little galaxies with tiny spiral arms, which I think are just absolutely adorable. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so you'll also notice the bright star is not in fact a point. It has, uh, it's, it's star shaped. It is an eight pointed star. 
Why is that? And we'll get into this a little bit in depth if you're really curious to dig into all the optics tomorrow. But just briefly, it's because Webb has a hexagon-shaped mirror. So you have a six-pointed star, uh, which is the biggest feature of the Webb point spread function. And that is a one point for every corner of the mirror. And then you also have another contribution to this diffraction pattern, and that's from the secondary mirror supports, which support uh, the, the secondary mirror in front of the primary mirror. And so you combine these two things together and you uh, overlap some of the diffraction spikes a bit and you get this eight point and star. So this is how you can tell right away a Hubble image from a web image. Hubble has four pointed stars, web has eight pointed stars. Okay, so our telescope has traveled to L2. It's cooled down, the mirrors are aligned and now uh, after a whole bunch of instrument calibration, we can start doing some science. So here is the first image released, Webb's first deep field. And this was uh, released to mark the start of Webb's science observations. And so we can walk through this <clears throat> image a little bit. We see our star in the foreground, this eight-pointed star. And this is a star within our own Milky Way galaxy, which is photobombing the image. If you look behind that a little bit, uh, you see these sort of white, um, fuzzy galaxy things, and that's a galaxy cluster, and that's SMAX 0723. And this galaxy cluster is so massive that it's warping space-time around it, and any galaxies that are behind it, when their light travels through this galaxy cluster, it's, their light gets warped and bent into these arcs that you see. And I encourage you to download this image and look at it in detail. It's absolutely gorgeous and fun. And there's all sorts of amazing little surprises there. Um, but part of the reason that we chose to take this first deep field in a, a galaxy cluster like this is because this gravitational lens allows us to see uh, light that we otherwise wouldn't see because this lens is distorting, but it's also magnifying these background galaxies. Um, okay, so that was the telescope works. <laughs> and now let's talk a little bit about the science. So we'll start off by uh, asking, why do we even want to study infrared light? Uh, so here are two views of, of some meerkats and a freshwater crocodile, right? And on the left, we have a visible light image taken with a normal camera. And then on the right, we have an infrared image taken with a fancy infrared camera. And we see that the little meerkats are glowing very brightly, right? And that's because you and me and the computer I'm talking into right now and those meerkats cute little tummies are all glowing very brightly in infrared light even if we can't see it with our eyes the freshwater crocodile on the other hand not quite glowing as brightly it's about the same color as the ground and that's because it's cold-blooded the meerkats are warm-blooded they're producing their own body heat the freshwater crocodile not so much so by looking at these animals with different wavelengths of light we're getting new pieces of information but wait, you say, Kelly, space is not full of meerkats. And I reply, <laughs> uh, yes, it is not full of meerkats, but it is full of dust. And by dust, I mean like dust, dust, like sand and soot dust. So here is a very famous Hubble image, the, the pillars of creation inside of the Eagle Nebula. And we see these dark, dusty, cold, pillars where new stars are forming. Uh, but it, you can't actually see inside of those pillars in Hubble's visible light view because it's getting blocked by the dust. If we look at uh, Hubble's near-infrared view, uh, we can see through these pillars to the stars forming inside and behind them. And then if we look in mid-infrared light, so uh, this is the best picture we have now of the pillars in mid-infrared light, but uh, stay tuned. We might have something cool coming soon. Uh, 
you see the pillars themselves glowing because we see this dust is glowing. So if you want to either see through dust or study the dust itself, like you want to study what the dust is made out of or where it is in a nebula or a galaxy, infrared light is really the place to do it. And uh, the other reason that we want to study infrared light, well, there are many, but another one is what we were talking about earlier, right? The universe is expanding. The light from the first galaxies gets stretched along with the expansion of space. So if you want to study the early universe, you really have to do it in infrared light. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's talk some science. Uh, so what is Webb doing in its first year? Here's a pie chart showing uh, the time allocated to different subjects in astronomy. Uh, the, the allocation is done by what is known as a, a dual anonymous peer review system. So anyone in the world can submit a proposal as long as you can make a good science case. So usually that means professional astronomers, but people from all around the world can submit proposals with your name taken off of it. So it's just the science that gets decided upon. Uh, and a committee of peers, other astronomers, evaluate all the proposals and give them time. So what is Webb going to study? Well, about 32% of the time in its first year is devoted to galaxies and the gas between galaxies. About 23% is exoplanets and disks around stars. About 12% is to study stars themselves. And then smaller chunks are taken up by supermassive black holes, populations of stars, things inside of the solar system, and also the large scale structure of the universe. Okay, so uh, first galaxies, this is a big science motivator for Webb. Here is Hubble's record holder. Uh, it's a galaxy called GNZ11. It's in the goods north field in the constellation Ursa Major. And we're seeing this galaxy as it was 13.4 billion years in the past, just 400 million years after the Big Bang. So that's the Hubble record, record holder. Um, and we are we have sort of competing claims right now for the Webb record holder. So I can't go through all of them, so I'm just going to highlight one survey here. Uh, this is the Cosmic yeah. Evolution Early Release Science Survey, or SEERS. And this is their deep field that they took. Um, it is 960 frames, um, and it took about 24 hours to collect all of this data. And so we see lots of cool little galaxies in this. We see a spiral galaxy. We see al this alignment of a bright galaxy with a whole trail of little smaller ones. I think the team compared it to Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, we have interacting galaxies um, and we have these interacting spiral galaxies and there's an arrow pointing to what may be the first supernova detected by Webb. Um, and uh, yeah. So those are all really cool. Uh, so the Sears team's farthest galaxy they think they have identified is uh, this galaxy called Maisie's Galaxy in order in honor of the project leader's daughter. Um, it is at a redshift of about 11.8, which is about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So right now there is... we're still understanding the telescope a little bit and there's still some calibration things that we're going through so take with a grain of salt any of these first galaxies claims but uh there it does seem that we can detect early galaxies with web with only small amounts of observing time which is really exciting and also there's hints that there may be more galaxies earlier than what our models were predicting. And if that's true, it's exciting because there's probably new physics going on and we have something to keep the theorists busy. Um, <laughs> so uh, another thing that Webb will observe is not just the first galaxies, but galaxies all throughout time, especially merging galaxies. 
So here, this is a Hubble image. And what you can't see here is this uh, galaxy uh, merger is actually not quite complete. And so there are two nuclei inside of this galaxy, but we can't see through it because of all of the gas and dust. But this is on a list of things that Webb will observe uh, this galaxy called NGC 3256. So this is a Hubble image, but I will show you some web images. And I forgot to mention, but all of the web images I'm showing today have a little web te telescope logo at the bottom so you can tell them apart. Uh, but here we have a, a train wreck, I guess, of a galaxy, the Cartwheel Galaxy. And I didn't realize until this was released that it's actually named after a, a wheel of a cart and not someone doing like the gymnastics move. Um, <laughs> but here we have a spiral galaxy and another smaller galaxy, which is not in frame, has crashed directly through the center of the galaxy and making this, this ripple effect. And so we have a core with spokes and then a ring around it. Uh, so the bright core has lots of hot dust and it also has a lot of very uh, young star clusters. And then the outer ring uh, has uh, is dominated by areas of star formation and supernovas. And so we can help understand the history of this galaxy and the aftermath of the merger by looking at it with infrared light. Uh, here's another group of interacting galaxies. Uh, this is Stefan's Quintet, uh, I guess made famous in the film, It's a Wonderful Life, but it's also a very well-studied uh, cluster, well, group of galaxies. So the galaxy on the left is actually uh, just a chance alignment. It's not interacting with the other galaxies. It's a very small dwarf galaxy, which again is photobombing our image. Um, and if you look closely, you can see individual stars, which is really cool. And then um, the topmost galaxy there, we see this very beautiful tidal tail being pulled out through interactions with the other four members of this galaxy group. Um, and then there's in the middle, it kind of looks like a smiley face a little bit. We have the, the um, you see, we have this galaxy here, the right eye of the smiley face. Um, it is called the high speed intruder in some papers, which I just absolutely love. It is a galaxy which is coming from behind and crashing through these other galaxies, which is creating all these shock waves of gas and dust, which you see um, in this interacting galaxy group. Uh, so that is the uh, near and mid infrared view. If we just look at it in mid infrared light, we see something pretty cool. So you notice that bright star-like thing that appears in the uppermost galaxy? That's not a star. That's a black hole. So the supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy is pulling in gas and dust and heating it up uh, to really high temperatures and is causing that to glow very brightly. So we are seeing the active core of this galaxy and we can't see it when we look at visible light or near infrared light because it's being shrouded by dust. But this mid infrared view is allowing us to see through the dust into the core of this galaxy. And that is in fact a theme. Webb is very good at studying black holes. So Webb will study black holes near and far. It will study black holes inside of our own Milky Way galaxy like Sagittarius A star, our resident supermassive black hole. There's actually a lot of dust in the line of sight to the center of the galaxy. So because Webb has infrared vision, it can see through this dust and it can study um, the stars and the gas and the dust that are orbiting our black hole. So um, in the past, people have asked me, oh, you saw that really cool event horizon telescope picture of Sagittarius A star. Can Webb do something like that? And the answer is unfortunately no. So the event horizon telescope is a radio telescope and they use some really clever math to uh, combine the images from telescopes all around the world. And they basically make a, a telescope that is effectively the size of the earth, right? So size of the earth, very big, able to resolve very, very fine details. Webb on the other hand, 
6.6 meter mirror, which is very much smaller than the entire earth. And so <laughs> we can't resolve that kind of detail, but we can see the stars and the gas that are is orbiting around Sagittarius A star. Uh, but zooming out a little bit, um, <laughs> as we saw in Stefan's quintet, We'll be able to study the centers of nearby galaxies, um, taking high resolution images and spectra to see how the gas is orbiting around those black holes um, to measure the speeds of that gas and the mass of the black holes, and also understand the feedback loop between the black hole, the jets that it puts off, and star formation inside of those galaxies. And then going even farther out, Webb will study quasars, which are active supermassive black holes in the early universe. And that might actually help us disentangle the chicken and egg problem that we have. What came first, galaxies or black holes? Um, but closer to home, Webb is going to, and is, I guess, tenses. Uh, Webb is studying star formation inside of our own galaxy. So again, um, if you look at a star forming region, which are these cold, dense, uh, dusty areas inside of our galaxy, you can't see what's going on very well. If you look with visible light, like Hubble, the Hubble infrared view of the Carina Nebula, allows you to see through this gas and dust to see what's going on inside. So this is Hubble Carina, a section, a very small section of the Carina Nebula. And this is Webb's uh, very small section of the Carina Nebula. And so this is a really gorgeous image. I think it's a lot of people's favorite uh, first image from Webb. Uh, and we see a couple things here. So we're seeing all sorts of stars which are embedded in this, this nebula, um, this cold, dusty nebula. Uh, so we're seeing all sorts of brand new stars that are just, that are still embedded in their stellar nursery. We're seeing jets coming off. We're seeing uh, pillars and uh, we're seeing uh, these stars blowing bubbles and the gas around them. Uh, also, outside of this frame is a star cluster of newly formed young hot stars, and this is eroding the nebula. And you can even in the background in the blue area see these streamers of gas of this eroding nebula sort of coming off of the denser part of the nebula. So this is really cool, and this is going to keep astronomers busy for a long time trying to figure out exactly what's going on in this picture kind of chaotic and beautiful and wonderful. Uh, this, I think, is my favorite web image to date, uh, 30 Doradus or the Tarantula Nebula. Again, we're seeing a similar thing. We're seeing a star forming region. It's cold. We have dense gas. We have dusty gas. And right in the middle is this star cluster. Um, and this is in the Large Magellanic Cloud. We see you have the star cluster in the middle and we have these stars sort of blowing a bubble and eroding the nebula around them. Uh, another star forming region, and this is another beautiful image. Um, this is a nebula very close to us, uh, the Orion bar. And the goal here is to understand this uh, star forming region in really great detail. So map out all of the uh, gas and dust and measure its temperatures, um, and see all of the fine details that we can resolve and then apply that understanding to star forming regions that are farther away that we can't resolve the details with. Um, so the team that put together this image um, studying the Orion Nebula pulled out a couple cool things here. We have a, uh, so starting from the upper right, we have a young star with a disk, and that disk is probably forming planets as we speak. Uh, we have these filaments of gas and dust. They're different shapes and sizes, and these particular filaments that they're highlighting here are very rich in these hydrocarbon, this soot-like dust. Uh, we have a bright star in its center, and you can see that the starlight from is reflecting off of the, the gas and dust and coloring it red. 
And then we also have a young star inside of a globule. So these are these are the really dense areas inside of the nebula where this new star is forming. And eventually the star is going to cast off its uh, embryonic state and start to shine. Okay, but Webb is not just starting studying a uh, star birth. It also studies normal stars and dying stars as well. So here's another of Webb's first images. This is the Southern Ring Nebula. And what we're seeing here is a planetary nebula. Again, nothing to do with planets. Uh, and this is the um, a star like our sun, which has run out of fuel. And so it's casting off its outer layers. And the cool thing about this is that it's actually a binary star system. So if you look in the near infrared view, you can't really see both stars, but it does pop out in the, the mid infrared view on the right here. And so that red star is actually the star that is responsible for the nebula. The bluer star is just kind of hanging out with its buddy orbiting and they're orbiting each other. And that's part of why we get this really cool, uh, very complex structure of this, this nebula, which is gradually wafting away from the star. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, Webb doesn't just study stars and galaxies. It also studies planets. Mm. Come on. Go. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is a calibration test image of Jupiter, which I think is pretty uh, all on its own. Um, but Webb will study planets inside of our solar system, including Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus. Uh, we can't point our several billion dollar telescope at the sun or we fry it. So we always have to look outward. But we can study the outer solar system with Webb. And we are right now. Um, so that bright point on the left there is a moon. I don't remember which moon it is. Uh, but uh, here is another of our solar system planets. This is Webb's first look at Mars. So we're seeing two different near infrared images here. Uh, so on the uh, top right hand corner, we have a near infrared image looking at reflected sunlight. And Mars is very red. And so you'll see that the, the visible light images and the near infrared uh, reflected light images sort of look the same. Uh, but things start to look different when you look a, a little bit longer wavelength, you start to see the planet itself glowing. And here we can see temperature differences on the day side of Mars. And we can see the Hellas Basin here is actually a little cooler than the rest of the planet, uh, which is pretty cool. And so Webb will help us understand Mars's atmosphere and complement the other uh, missions that we have observing Mars from both orbit and on the ground. Uh, so here is another planet, and I think this is my favorite planet photo so far. This is um, an image of Neptune. We see the rings of Neptune uh, in great detail for the first time in 30 years since the Voyager flyby. And we also uh, see the moon Triton. So what looks like a star in the upper left-hand corner there is in fact a moon. Triton is a captured Kuiper Belt object. It's covered in nitrogen ice and some other like weird ices, which makes it ridiculously shiny in the infrared. It reflects something like 80% of the incident sunlight at infrared wavelengths which may actually makes the moon brighter than the planet in the infrared, which is just crazy. Um, and we also have a whole smattering of other little moons orbiting around the planet. Um, another solar system object of note. Um, so last week we had a, uh, no, this week, right? Monday, gosh, time flies. Uh, <laughs> we had a uh, the DART mission deliberately slammed itself into the asteroid uh, Diamorphos. And here we have Webb's view of the ejecta coming off after the collision, which is really cool. Uh, and also, 
This was the first time that Hubble and Webb simultaneously observed the same object. So we have pictures before and after the collision, and we're going to use that to complement other ground-based observations to try to figure out exactly what was kicked off out of this asteroid, and also if we were successful in changing the orbit of this binary asteroid that is still TBD, but I'm looking forward to more news in the next couple of days about that. But this is uh, breaking news, uh, Hubble and Webb's observations of the dark collision. Um, and just a preview of things to come. Uh, so Webb will observe other Kuiper Belt objects other than the moon Triton. Here is everyone's favorite king of the Kuiper Belt, Pluto. And if you are following the JWST observation bot, you will see that Webb has already observed Pluto, but the data isn't public yet. So I'm looking forward to see what Webb sees. Uh, but Webb will help us understand all of these cool <laughs> icy things in the outer solar system, um, complementing New Horizons uh, observations of Pluto, which is what we're seeing here. But it'll also study Eris to learn about the kinds of ices that are on its surface, Sedna to explore why this dwarf planet is so red, and also Humea to learn about its moons and its ring system. Uh, but it's not just planets in our own solar system. Webb will also observe planets around other stars. So this is a Keck uh, observation of the planet system HR8799. So you can't actually see the star in this image. We have what is called a coronagraph blocking our view. We're blocking out the bright star so we can see the faint planets orbiting around it. Um, so this is a ground-based image, but also uh, Webb has a coronagraph on it as well. And it turns out that infrared is a really great place to look for planets because there tends to be the greatest contrast between stars, which tend to be brighter invisible light, and planets, which tend to glow in infrared light. So um, here is Webb's first direct observation of a planet. Um, we have blocked out the star to see the faint planet nearby. Uh, so the blobbiness here is just an artifact of the telescope optics. It's just a single point, but we can see the planet HIP uh, HIP uh, 6542-6b in this image in both near-infrared and mid-infrared light. Um, another way to observe planets is what is called transit spectroscopy. So this is where we're taking a planet and we're watching it pass in front of its star. And we're watching starlight shine through the planet's atmosphere. And the atmosphere will block some wavelengths of light and let other wavelengths of light through. And we can use that information to figure out what the planet's atmosphere is made out of, even for planets that are a thousand light years away, uh, like this planet WASP-96b. So if we take an analysis of this, so this is a real light curve from this planet. This is actual web data. You can see the dip going down when the planet goes in front of the star. If we look at how much the, the light dips at different wavelengths, we get this wavy line of data points. And each one of those humps is water absorbing light from that star. So we have detected water on a planet a thousand light years away. And this is a really weird planet, by the way. Nothing like this exists in our own solar system. Uh, it is, let's see if I have it here. Uh, it's something like... Uh, the size of Jupiter, the mass of Saturn orbiting on like a three day orbit. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's so totally bizarre, but it's planets <laughs> like these that are the easiest observations to make. So you might see a lot of web news of these hot Jupiters and that's what web is going to do first. But also uh, we're hoping to characterize the atmospheres of much smaller planets like this, the TRAPPIST-1 system. So this is seven rocky planets. Uh, they're roughly Earth-sized, and they orbit this ultra-cool star 39 light years away. And so the hope is to 
characterize the bulk properties of these atmospheres. So do these planets have an atmosphere at all? If they do, what is it made out of? Is it made out of water vapor? Is it made out of nitrogen like the Earth? Or is it made out of carbon dioxide like Mars or Venus? So these observations also have already been made and uh, they're being analyzed as we speak. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but that is uh, all I have. I hope you enjoyed going along on this journey with me about the early universe, uh, galaxies over time, the star life cycle and other worlds. And you're looking forward to more web science to come. And so with that, I can uh, take any questions you have. All right, well, um, we do have a couple of questions uh, here and um, we'll see if we have some uh, in, the, uh, in the chat. So what's your first question? My question is, if earlier galaxies and stars are more visible uh, due to Doppler shift um, with longer wavelengths, why don't we focus on really long wavelengths like X-rays or radio waves? Okay, so... The question was, uh, if some galaxies and stars are more visible because of the Doppler shift, because of the, the redshift, the expansion of the universe, why don't we focus on really long wavelengths, um, so like radio waves? And we do. Uh, the ALMA Observatory, for example, is a radio or submillimeter uh, telescope, and it does <laughs> similar science to what Webb is doing, and it can also kind of help confirm some of Webb's discoveries, but they all have kind of lousy resolution. So radio telescopes are very weird beasts, um, and they kind of work more like antennas than, than, than telescopes. Why don't we focus on far infrared light then? And it's just, it's a matter of it being very technically difficult to do, because you have to keep your telescope really, really cold in order to do that. And Webb is sort of pushing it with what we can do with a telescope that doesn't have cryogens on it. So Spitzer had uh, cryogenic gas or uh, liquids on board, and they used that to keep the telescope cold. But eventually, those boiled off, and then the telescope wasn't cold anymore. Um, and so Webb was designed to not have that limitation and basically be able to uh, be out there as long as its propellant holds out and as long as the um, all of the computer and the instruments hold out. So the, the limiting thing is not the cryogens. Any other questions here uh, in the room? Uh, I have a question. Um, again, it, obviously it's, you know, at L2, they have it oriented so that the sun shield is always facing toward the sun. But what degree of um, movement do you have to be able to, uh, you know, in other words, you, you can only see a certain spread of of the universe at, at any particular point in its mm -hmm. orbit around the sun Could you yeah that that is correct i don't remember the exact angle but you can tilt web uh forward and back um some degrees um so uh you get a certain field of view and then as web completes its orbit around the sun with the earth you get the entire uh night sky with mm -hmm. the exception of the area immediately around the sun um, so yeah, there is a degree, I can say like, I, I won't say because I will get it wrong because I don't have the number on the top of my head, but yes, there is a certain amount of tilt back and forth that you can safely do. Um, and basically it's limited by trying to not get the telescope too hot. And how, another question in the back, yeah. I understand this telescope has got like thrusters on it. So are there plans to, excuse me. Plans to refuel? Is that even possible? Okay. Yeah, the question was, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, propellant on the telescope. Uh, can we refuel Webb? And is there any plans to do it? Um, so when we launched, uh, it was, we were uncertain about what, if we would have enough propellant to do um, a really long mission. So. The web is specced for a five-year mission, and there was a hope to do maybe 10 years. Um, but the injection into the right orbit by the Ariane um, 5 rocket was so good that we used less uh, propellant than we thought we would to get web into the right orbit around L2. 
which means that we have more than 20 years of uh, propellant left on web. So there was thinking at the beginning, maybe we should try to figure out a way to refuel web because we have this cool $9 billion telescope. Wouldn't it be a waste if we only had it for five years? But now we have a lot, a lot more propellant on it than we actually need. So something else on web will probably go first. Um, and as of now, there's no way to send someone out there to fix it. Uh, I don't know, maybe in 20 years, we'll figure something out. All right, Mark. <clears throat> are the pictures we've seen, are they a correct view, mirror image, upside down? Uh, how are, um, so you can, uh, there's a compass image on all of them. They're published and they show you uh, which way is north. I don't know. I think some of some of them might get uh, flipped for artistic regions reasons, so I don't remember off the top of my head. But that information is available if you want to go look it up. It's interesting. You can actually see of the uh, the uh, of the eight point star. There's the that uh, two smaller uh, spikes that come out, mm -hmm. and uh, you could. I, mean, I remember seeing on, on one of the maybe it was the Orion Belt uh, image that it was like candid almost you know 90 degrees or something like that yep so that that is another clue about the the orientation of the exactly how it was taken versus um the the how the uh, person who processed the image chose to orient the, the photo um i understand i've heard that um uh, web has actually taken some uh, micromedia uh, hits and uh, what I guess what got hit was it the sun shield was it the the mirror or uh, some other aspect and, and and any effect that was been noticed noticed by that? Yeah, so um, I know at least the mirror has been hit. Um, and so a couple months ago, it made the news that a micrometeorite had hit the mirror's web, web <laughs> web's mirror, uh, and caused it was sort of a bigger impact than they were expecting this early in the mission. Uh, the good thing is, is that all of the images that I have showed you today, with the exception of that very first alignment image, were all taken after that big impact. Uh, so one thing that Webb has is, number one, it was designed with this, these micrometeorite impacts in mind. Eventually, this is going to limit the um, the resolution and the, the temperature of the telescope as these build up over time. Um, but that was a design choice um, be, to not enclose web in a tube, but instead have it open to space. So this is a trade-off. Um, but number two, we have these repositionable mirrors. And so we were actually able to more or less cancel out this little dent that's in Webb's mirror now by just moving the mirror slightly. So we can actually correct for all of these things. And there's a team at Space Telescope that is in charge of that. Very cool. Sort of the... Uh... Stellar body shop, as it were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you, oh, we have a couple of questions from the uh, chat. Yep. Uh, so the first question is: Will the large diffraction spikes obscure important data? Ah, yeah. So will the um, diffraction spikes obscure important data? Um, it depends. So usually you'll try to plan your observation around that not happening. Uh, I have definitely seen a an image in the web uh, news team meeting with a diffraction spike going right through the middle of something, and we're like, hmm, should we try to like remove that for the public image or just keep it in? It's kind of cool, but it's also distracting. Um, this is um, sometimes if you're doing like archival science, so if you're going through and you're using the image for something that wasn't intended. Sometimes you will get a diffraction spike right in an annoying place. I remember there was a team going through Hubble images and they were trying to figure out um, the location of a supernova. And there happened to be a diffraction spike right in the location going right over where that supernova was, well, which is annoying. So uh, yes, sometimes, <laughs> I guess is the answer. Another question is... Yep. The second question is, can Webb view the tenuous atmospheres of moons like the Galilean moons or Enceladus? Uh, yes. So there are plans to observe um, the uh, large moons in the solar system. 
Uh, the problem with solar system science is that all of those objects are very shiny and bright. And so you have to take very, very short observations. And so we're still kind of figuring out how to do that right now. But that is in the works. And it will, as we understand the telescope better, it'll, the science will get better. All right. Any other questions from um, the room here? Um, I'll throw another one at you. Um, again, you got with the, uh, the, the, the deep space, uh, you know, uh, telescope, I mean, uh, the, you know, uh, radio uh, radio communication array that you've got the, the, the three mm -hmm. main scopes um how often do you send commands up to 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 web and also uh are there certain windows where you where you know where each of those stations can talk to it and and do they sort of share that load equally yeah so um we download we downlink twice a day um in that so this deep space network is shared with a lot of different space telescopes. So there's a lot of scheduling that goes into who can downlink when. Um, when Webb was in its uh, commissioning process, when we were uh, unfolding the sun shield and the mirrors and stuff, we had more time on the deep space network to continuously talk to the telescope. Um, so now we get uh, two downlinks per day, and that's depending on the schedule of the rest of the deep space network and what telescope or sort of what uh, dish is in range to web during its downlink time. And, and also during those windows, you you would then uplink, uplink commands as to yep. where to, where to slew and, and how long to watch. Kind of. Yes. Right. Another question? Well, I'm just curious, who regulates that deep space network and who gets to do what, when? That's a good question. Who who regulates the deep space network? I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm sure there's a team that's responsible for that, but I don't know. I'll have to look that up. That's a good question. Hmm. All right. I'll have that answer tomorrow. Another reason to come to my talk. Right, there you go. Come tomorrow. Uh, also, for those for those that are unable to to return here, uh, you know, live for uh, the second day of Astrofest, we will be live streaming. Uh, Dr. Lipo's uh, presentation tomorrow. So uh, you can always watch, like we've got, uh, we had somewhere between 25 and 30 people online from uh, a wide range of uh, locations. Uh, uh, Added to the, uh, here I'll do another pan here, just so uh, you can sort of see, everybody wave, please. <laughs> there you go. So, um, all right, well, unless there's uh, any other questions, um, Art, are you, what's the what's the what's the sky forecast? Uh, I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I'll just take a quick look right now. All right, so we'll uh, we'll take a look, and uh, we wish we had last night's skies here tonight, um, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll uh, we'll do our best with what we can. Uh, Dr. Lieber, thank you so much. These were just outstanding. Well, thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. And uh, we look forward to your talk tomorrow and um, uh, have, have a good evening. Okay, clear skies. Bye, Thanks. guys. All I can see was Jupiter through the high clouds. <laughs> All right, so uh, those clouds move, so we may be able to get some uh, better views of it. Uh, <laughs> For those especially who, who have never been here before, this is their first visit. Um, let's say a quarter after, I will um, I'll do a, a brief tour of uh, of the facility and uh, tell you a little bit about the kinds of stuff that we do here. So, uh, if uh, if you'd like to do that, meet me out right in front of the you know the, the main lobby here next to the store, and we'll uh, we'll take you through. Um, otherwise, go and observe. <laughs> Thank you.